Um, I have some unknown cases for you. We'll go through these real quickly. Here's case one. Case two. Case three, ultrasound in the right upper quadrant. Case four, ultrasound in the right upper quadrant. And case five. And that's what case five was here, where you can see there's pneumatosis involving bowel loops, especially in the right lower quadrant. Now, pneumatosis is not the first thing you see with necrotizing enterocolitis. It's usually you see a focal ileus, a fixed dilated bowel loop. Necroti when you start seeing um, pneumatosis, you're starting to see some of the bad complications of necrotizing enterocolitis. Once the infection, the infection spreads and the pneumatosis spreads, it can be picked up by the uh, mesenteric venous system, and that's how you end up with portal venous gas, which you can see here, it's branching pattern going peripherally in the liver. And the most severe finding is that you end up with a bowel perforation. And here is a pneumoperitoneum with the football sign. I would caution you on every single chest x-ray on a baby you look at, draw a line across the liver. It should say, stay the same whiteness. If you see it getting darker, worry that you're dealing with a pneumoperitoneum. You can also see a little bit of a Wrigler sign here. And you can also see air along the uh, falciform ligament. Next, I'm going to talk about abdominal wall defects, the closure of the unusual to see a midgut volvulus in those groups. Gastroschisis is a lateral fold defect, usually on the right, uh, next to a normal umbilicus. It's probably a vascular accident. You see infrequent associated abnormalities. The only bowel herniates into the defect, and it is not covered by peritoneum. Because of that, you, the bowel is exposed to amniotic fluid, and you'll get a very strong fibrotic and serous response uh, with an inflammatory peel, and there can be neuronal disruption of normal bowel peristalsis in the bowel that was out in the amniotic fluid. So even after they repair these patients, there can be some difficulties related to this lesion. Uh, here's an example of a gastroschisis. You can see the umbilical arterial catheter coming in and the bowel defect with soft tissue mass to the right of the umbilicus. We're going to march our way down through some of the enteric obstructions in the newborn, starting up high and ending down low. Uh, the first one is the esophageal tracheoesophageal esophageal atresia, tracheoesophageal fistula, which is usually um, a combination. It's not that common to see a pure esophageal atresia. It's usually suspected early on um, because of maternal polyhydramnios because the fetus cannot normally swallow the amniotic fluid. Um, the patients will present after birth with drooling and coughing and choking, and they're unable to feed. You cannot pass an NG tube. Um, half of these patients will have esophageal fistula. And here's an example of a patient that has a proximal esophageal atresia. You can see the distended, air-filled proximal esophageal pouch. Air is great contrast. We use it where we can. And here you can see another patient that has the proximal atresia with the esophageal catheter only to this level. Um, but you can see that there is a distal tracheoesophageal fistula because you see air in the distal esophagus and in dilated bowel. This patient also has associated vertebral segmentation anomalies with a hemivertebra, and you can see that there's multiple dilated bowel loops um, because this patient had an imperfect anus. Um, the heart is um, not visualized here, that, but this patient did have a VSD. Uh, there can be associated renal anomalies and limb, usually radial ray abnormalities in patients with the vectoral association. And just for kicks, this patient also had bilateral dislocated hips. Here's a patient with esophageal atresia without a tracheoesophageal fistula. You suspect there's no distal tracheoesophageal fistula when you do not see any bowel gas. And this is more associated with Downs patients. The H or N type fistula is an unusual fistula that you will see, and um, it is basically a, a, a patent communication between the esophagus and the trachea. And when you're looking for this, you have to be very 
aware that it can be present um, because you, you need to look on your upper GI during the first swallow. The contrast that goes into the esophagus squirts back up into the trachea. So if you're not watching, you may think that the patient aspirated rather than this being a fistula. These patients will often present with recurrent pneumonias. And one other clue that I use is that if you look at the chest x-rays along these recurrent pneumonias, you'll see that they always have a lot of bowel gas. That as, as easily as the fluid goes from the esophagus to the trachea, the air goes from the trachea to the esophagus, and these patients have aerophagia. Intestinal obstruction is the most common abdominal emergency in the newborn period, and these patients present just as you would expect with abdominal distension and poor feeding and vomiting. And we try to classify them as either high, which is above the distal jejunum, or low, which is below the pull. Again, air is great contrast. We have a classic double bubble sign with um, a esophageal catheter clear into the uh, duodenal bulb. This patient did get contrast, and it sort of looks like the top of a frosty ice cream cone where that uh, atresia is. But you can see there's chronic dilatation of the duodenum, and that's what gives you your duodenal bulb or your double bubble sign. The duodenal web is more common in the, in the Downs population, and what it starts out is just a diaphragm with a hole in it. And when the babies are little and they're just drinking um, liquid, the liquid goes through that okay. But then as they start to eat some solid food, little particles will get caught behind that hole and they'll, you'll start to stretch the uh, diaphragm and you'll finally end up with a big pouch or windsock deformity with a small hole. And then as the kids start eating things like Cheerios and peas and things like that, it gets blocked up and they have vomiting intermittently. And here you can see that windsock deformity with the normal caliber duodenum beyond that. If you remember one thing from the pediatric lectures, please remember bowel rotation and midgut malrotation and midgut volvulus because this is a lesion that will kill a child. The bowel returns to the abdomen at four to ten weeks of gestation and it does that after it's herniated out into the yolk sac by making three counterclockwise 90 degree turns and that gives you your normal duodenal sweep with the duodenal jejunal junction fixed posteriorly by the ligament of trites and a long, small bowel mesentery extending to the right lower quadrant. And that's why your bowel doesn't twist as you have this nice, long, fixated mesentery. When we do an upper GI, we watch on every single baby and every single child to make sure that we see a normal position of the duodenal sweep. On the lateral view, the duodenal bulb is still intraperitoneal. Um, and then when we get to the end of the duodenal bulb, we are retroperitoneal. This, the duodenum should come down posteriorly, cross the spine posteriorly, and go back up posteriorly, all retroperitoneal. When the pa we turn the patient supine, the duodenal jejunal junction will be to the left of the midline at the same level as the posterior part of the duodenal bulb or the initial retroperitoneal part of the duodenum. You got it. So when they, because the mesentery is short, the bowel can twist. When it twists, it cuts off its blood supply. And this is a patient, this is a slide of a slide of a slide of a slide of somebody that was having, probably they thought mesenteric ischemia, it's an adult patient, but this was a midgut volvulus, and it looks like a braid is that uh, superior mesenteric artery and its branches are twisted because of the short mesentery. 75% who have malrotation who are going to get a midgut volvulus do it in the first six weeks of life. And the classic history is acute onset of bilious vomiting, and it can occur in the first day of life. The diagnosis, again, is made with an upper GI series. Here's a five-day-old who was eating normally, suddenly developed bilious vomiting. You can see there's a disproportionate bowel gas pattern, dilated stomach, only a little bit of gas beyond. Think about an obstruction with that pattern. Here's the upper GI, and you can see the classic corkscrew appearance of a midgut volvulus. This is our case one unknown, jejunal atresia. We have a dilated proximal bowel, uh, not a lot of distal bowel. How do I tell it's proximal and not distal bowel? A few loops versus a lot of loops.
Um, this is just a few loops. And you also have to notice that this patient has had an in utero perforation because we can see a meconium peritonitis with a meconium. There's a patient who has ileal atresia. Um, you can see that there's dilated bowel loops on the right side of the abdomen, less but still dilated bowel loops on the left side of the abdomen, and there's lots of loops. So we're thinking about a distal obstruction. A lot of people would want to say, oh, that's the right colon, but you can see here by this enema we have a microcolon, we have a few loops of non-dilated small bowel, and when we get into the mid-ilium, we then have the dilated ilium behind it. So this is actually ilium, not. Here's a patient that has meconium ileus, lots of dilated bowel loops, distal bowel obstruction. We do our um, enema, and we can see that when we come over into the right colon, we have multiple filling defects going back into the terminal ilium, meconium ileus. Here's another one where we see a microcolon, and as we come over onto the right, we can see filling defects nicely back into the terminal ilium. Now, in these patients, an enema can help. Um, in about half of the patients, if you can just get some contrast, water-soluble contrast around the meconium, you can sort of lubricate it up and crack it up so it'll pass. And that can be very helpful. And you may have to do several of these enemas to get this to happen. But the only alternative they have is going to surgery where the surgeon will either try to milk the meconium forward um, into the colon or may end up having to resect bowel. The perforation rate is about 3%. Colonic atresia is rare. It's evenly distributed throughout the colon. Um, it's a vascular injury, so it's more commonly seen in the, in my experience, in the watershed zones. And it may coexist with other atresias. So if you see one colonic atresia, look real hard for the rest of the bowel uh, for other atresias. Here you can see multiple dilated loops, distal bowel obstruction. And on our enema, we have a atresia. Um, here is a patient who has multiple dilated bowel loops, distal bowel obstruction. When we do our enema, we can see that there's a small colon with transition at the splenic flexure to a relatively large caliber colon. This is the typical appearance of functional immaturity of the colon. Now, the one caveat I will put with this is that you must make sure that if you think you have either a meconium plug or a small left colon, that as soon as you do the enema, the kid will start stooling normally. If that doesn't happen, Hirschsprung's disease can mimic a lot of things, and both of these diagnoses can be mimicked by Hirschsprung's disease. Here's another patient who has a meconium plug. You can see that there's multiple dilated bowel loops. There was a failure to pass meconium. Uh, when we do our enema, we can see a normal caliber rectum uh, with a plug, multiple dilated bowel loops, distal bowel obstruction. When we do our enema, we can see that we have a small and spastic looking rectum. Normally the rectum should be bigger than the sigmoid colon. This clearly isn't. And we can see dilated more proximal colon. Here's another patient who has Hirschsprung's disease, and it looks very much like that small left colon uh, the case that I showed you, so be careful. Um, Hirschsprung's disease, as I go along, it becomes one of, the di one of the diagnoses that I am very humble about because it's a tough one to make. And the more cases you see, the harder it gets. You can have Hirschsprung's disease involving the whole colon, in which case you have a shortened, featureless looking colon. It can go back and involve more of the small bowel. The further back it goes, the less well the patient. A pediatric surgeon will want to know, um, based on plain films, if it's a high or low lesion because their surgical approach is very different. And here you can see a baby that has dilated bowel all the way down to the rectum. They want prone cross table lateral butt up pictures, and they're basically trying to get the air down distal in the rectum to see if it goes below the line between the coccyx and the pubis or if it stays above that line. If it goes below that line, it's a low imperforatus. If it stays above that line, the, la the air is distal, as you can see, it is above that line. You don't know if it's because there's meconium stuck down there and it's a low imperforatus, but you're just not getting any air down, or if it's high. So you're basically looking for to try to confirm that it is a low. Um, if it's a, otherwise, you can't tell. Uh, sometimes you'll end up seeing rectourethral fistulas in boys, and the symptom will be that they're uh, urinating fecal material. And here you can see on this BCUG that the child does have a clear fistula between the posterior urethra and the rectum. 
Girls will never have this. You will see a rectovaginal fissure muscle layer of the pylorus. Again, disproportionate bowel gas pattern, dilated stomach, paucity of distal gas. The normal pylorus on ultrasound, you can see fluid filled. Here's the echogenic mucosa and the thin normal muscular layer of the pylorus. Here's the triangular duodenal bulb, normal liver. Pyloric stenosis, they call it the cervix sign. It's an enlarged, thickened pylorus where you can see the muscle is more than three millimeters and more than 15 millimeters in width and length respectively. You'll also see shouldering of the muscle back into the antrum of the stomach. Um, and let me tell you, it's much better to do this by ultrasound than to try to do the upper GI that has, takes about six years to do because guess what? They have a gastric outlet obstruction. But if you take this pylorus and put it right on here, you can see what we're looking at. Here's the shouldering of the pyloric muscle back into the antrum that gives you your teat sign. You have the elongated, narrowed pylorus. Here's the duodenal bulb. Acute hepatitis. In the susception, big problem in little kids. Um, most common between about three months and two years of age for the idiopathic type of intussusception. Bowel gas pattern can be anything. Um, and no plain film will make me not do a, an evaluation for an intussusception except for a left lateral decubitus where I can see the entire cecum filled up with air. Uh, this patient had an intussusception. Here you can see on this prone air, uh, contrast enema, we can see the filling defect in the right colon. It's a bad sign if you fill the appendix before you reduce the intussusception, those usually. Abdominal radiographs are important because your only contraindication for doing an enema to try to reduce an intussusception is if there is peritonitis or free air or pneumatosis. So you've got to have a plain film to make sure you don't have pneumatosis or free air. It doesn't matter how long the intussusception has been there. That's not a contraindication for an enema. And again, if we cut across, here's the typical target sign, which you have the mucosas, the fat, the uh, sclerosis of the, um, uh, you have uh, mucosa muscularis, mucosa mu muscularis. You may have some fat from the, um, from the mesentery pulled into the bowel into the intussusception. It's most common in the right upper quadrant or along the course of the transverse colon. Ultrasound is very sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of appendicitis. Um, from then, we can go on to treatment, and you can either use a enema that's pneumatic or water-soluble contrast. It depends on your comfort level. There is a small risk of perforation. It's actually higher with air than with contrast, but it tends to be cleaner with air than with contrast. If it's not successful, which is about 25% of the time, the baby will... If I do see a gallbladder, one of the things I'll do is I'll feed the baby, because um, that's a nice physiologic test to show that the gallbladder can contract. And if that happens, then you don't have biliary atresia. You have a patent extrahepatic biliary tree. Um, here's a patient with neonatal hepatitis. We can see a gallbladder, and when they go in and do a gallbladder uh, cholangiogram, um, choli choliangiogram, you can see that there is a small but patent extrahepatic biliary. So here's a typical neonatal hepatitis at 60 minutes. We see uptake by the liver. We see some excretion by the uh, GU system, um, but we see nothing in the bowel, but at 24 hours, we on ultrasound, you usually don't see a gallbladder. You see the triangular cord sign where, where the gallbladder should be. All you see is echogenic fibrotic material, and usually the liver echo texture is normal. By hepatobiliary syncytigraphy, there is no excretion into the biliary tree by 24 hours. This is treated with a Kasai procedure, and we continue to have to image these patients because they get ascending cholangitis, they get portal hypertension, and need to know all of that. But realize that you look for dilated cystic masses adjacent to a normal gallbladder. Here's a cholangiogram showing uh, a cholidocal cyst. Here's a CT where you have the normal gallbladder. Cystic mesenchymal hamartomas of the liver. Um, they are often pedunculated off of the liver, and uh, they will present as a right upper quadrant cystic mass. Duodenal duplication cysts. What you want to look for when you're doing an ultrasound of these is the gut wall signature, the mucosa, hypoechoic muscle, hyperechoic cirrhosis. So look on all your ultrasounds if you're doing a, if you see a cystic right upper quadrant lesion for that gut wall signature. CSF pseudocyst, not uncommon in patients that have VP shunts. You'll usually see the shunt uh, within the cyst.